Jonah, welcome. It's great to have you. Thank you. I have a couple of questions for you, but before we dive into those, let's start with the basics. Introduce yourself. Sure. I'm Jonah Friedman. I am the product manager for proceduralism and simulation, and I work on Bifrost here. Speaking of Bifrost, for people who might not know what Bifrost is, let's get everyone on the same page. What, what is Bifrost? Bifrost is a node-based visual programming environment inside of Maya. Uh, where you can create uh, simulations and instancing and scattering, and you can do procedural USD, and you can build your own tools to build your own uh, procedural effects. And where did the name Bifrost come from? One of the principal creators of Bifrost, Marcus Nordenstam, is uh, Swedish, and he's into Norse mythology. And the Bifrost in Norse mythology, which you'll know from the movie Thor, um, is, is the rainbow bridge to Asgard, the, the, the magical land of the gods. So the idea is that Bifrost is a bridge that gets you to this magical land where everything is amazing and yeah. It's a good, it's a good name. It is a good name. So studios and freelancers alike, they're looking for business health, right? They want consistent cash flow, busy talent, new customers, retaining customers. How does Bifrost help businesses, both large and small, grow? Well, if you use Maya, you already have access to it, and you already have a pretty generous allotment of licenses to use with it. So anybody who's using Maya now can put in Bifrost into their production with no additional cost in the environment that their artists are already very, very familiar with. Nowadays, when I'm opening YouTube, when I'm reading industry news, when I'm looking at a lineup at an event like SIGGRAPH, open standards are everywhere, especially OpenUSD. We know it's an important topic, but why is open standards so important? Open standards are not really a new thing in the VFX uh, industry. Their, their importance has only increased over time. Um, people care a lot about the formats that their data is in because their data represents assets that they've invested a lot into, all of the artist's time. A lot of these, these films and uh, television shows are recurring. Like they, they want to keep going back to these assets to produce new content. And proprietary formats, which is the alternative to open standards, um, are, are seen as kind of vendor lock-in. They're seen as a risk. Because if the software that reads and writes those, those uh, proprietary formats stops existing, uh, then you lose your data. And uh, you, know, you, you, you then have an emergency where you need to rescue your data. Nobody wants this. Um, instead, for most things, we've moved to uh, open standards that can be read by a, a wide variety of software. Um, for example, OpenVDB will, will, uh, is the volume data of choice. There used to be a lot of smaller standards that, were, um, that, that came from different companies and different places, but now everybody wants to write OpenVDB and read OpenVDB, and it's tremendously important for rendering of volumes, for example. And USD is coming out as a really significant uh, open standard um, because it's not targeting any small niche of the, uh, of, of the VFX or animation process. It's, it's kind of targeting the entire thing. And it's also got some workflow ideas baked into it. Um, things like how scenes are supposed to be combined in order to uh, do what's called scene assembly. And for these reasons, USD is, is one of the most important open standards that there are, uh, especially for the future. We have a Maya USD integration as well as a Bifrost USD integration. What's the difference between the two and how do they work together? Yeah, we think of them as, as part of the same kind of ecosystem. Um, Bifrost USD, it's, it, it talks to, the, to Maya USD, and it's critically important that it does um, because it's all one workflow. Um, inside of Bifrost, you can procedurally author USD, and then in the uh, Maya USD environment, you can, you can manipulate USD with all of the normal Maya type of manipulations. One example where this is really good is Bifrost does instancing and scattering. So um, you're scattering around grass and flowers and all these things. If your production's in USD, then your grass and flower assets and all of these things are already in USD. So what Bifrost is going to do for you there is it's going to do the scattering and it's going to take in your USD assets as an input and then output USD as an output. Um, and so it can kind of fit seamlessly into a USD pipeline in that way. 
there's no shortage of voices in a crowd when you're dealing with something as subjective as art. So how does Bifrost help artists iterate quickly and make changes to respond to feedback? When you're creating something procedurally, then a very small change can have a very large effect. Like, for example, changing the number of flowers in the grass, to go back to that original example. If you change it to 10% flowers instead of 5% flowers, that's a change of a single number that might add hundreds of flowers to your scene, for example. Um, so, so little changes like that allow you to really change things in, in a wide swath uh, very quickly and efficiently. And for folks who are listening and they're like, hey, I, I want to try Bifrost, what steps do you recommend? If you want to try Bifrost and you want to get started with it, um, we have an excellent new series on YouTube called Bifrost Bootcamp, uh, which is a college level course that teaches Bifrost uh, from the basics. It teaches Bifrost USD. It gives an introduction to the simulation systems. Um, you can really kind of pick what you want in there and it'll have something for you. Additionally, there is a user-driven Bifrost community on Discord called Bifrost Addicts. But it's great. Uh, we have a vibrant community of users helping each other, of showing their artwork, um, asking questions, answering questions, and also we're there. Um, a lot of the Bifrost, uh, by the Bifrost team is on this Discord, uh, and we answer questions there sometimes too. Speaking of the Bifrost Addicts Discord channel, I asked them, if they have any questions for you, because I told them we'd be speaking today. And a couple questions came in, so I will ask you some questions from, from the community. Um, Marvolo from the Bifrost community asked, any plans to integrate the Maya Bifrost liquid system into the Bifrost graph? Uh, yeah, thanks Marvolo for the question. Um, it's a very timely question because that is in progress as we speak. Um, additionally, the liquid meshing which is the part that turns a point cloud from a liquid simulation into a liquid surface, uh, that's also going into Bifrost as a reusable building block. So you can use it to, to mesh your liquids, but you can also use it to mesh something like snow produced by the MPM system or anything else that is a point cloud. So this is now another tool in the Bifrost grab bag that can be used for general purpose, uh, all sorts of stuff. Like for example, you could scatter points just kind of arbitrarily and use this to create icicles if you wanted to. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about animation. Animation is so important in any VFX studio's arsenal. We have a question from Stefan K who asked, anything you can share about rigging components in Bifrost? Yeah, um, rigging is something that we get asked about a lot, as you can imagine. Um, and that is because there is a ton of technical talent in the Maya world, uh, specifically in rigging. Like riggers are essentially doing visual programming already in terms of in, in the rigs that they're building. And so riggers basically from the start have been telling us like, yeah, that simulation stuff is all well and good, but you know, this is really about rigging, right? And yeah. Um, so over the last few years, we've been kind of setting the stage for that. Um, we've been, the, one of the main things that we've been doing is we've been working on the overheads of evaluation inside of Bifrost, um, where the simulation and the uh, procedural kind of effects, uh, where those take milliseconds or seconds to compute, the, the rigs or the, the components of the rigs, we expect those to take microseconds to compute. So going from milliseconds to microseconds suddenly means that you have to reason in different ways about performance. Um, so an overhead on the graph that's a few milliseconds might not matter in, in, in the current case, but for a rigging component, actually, it absolutely does matter. So b because of this, we've been working on reducing these overheads wherever we possibly can, and that's been going on over the last couple of years. So what we're looking at first is not the deformation part of the pipeline, but the control rig part of the pipeline. So uh, things like skeletons and transforms and constraints and all of these kinds of things, so we want users to be able to build components of rigs and be able to use them in their existing rigs. And users are already building components of rigs inside of Bifrost. Uh, for example, we've seen users build spline IKs. We've seen them build things like uh, a car that bounces around on suspension, like a cartoony car with big squishy wheels that kind of like you know, bounces around the landscape that it's on. Um, we've seen all kinds of fun examples like that where they need something a little bit more bespoke than what's available out of the box which is, of course, 
uh, where Bifrost is going to excel. Do Bifrost's rigging components complement Maya's rigging components? Uh, absolutely. Um, the components that people are building in Bifrost for rigging are usually a small component of a rig. There are, there are some, some bespoke and really important piece uh, for their particular application that they then want to put into a larger rig that is a conventional Maya rig. Another question for you. Bruce Lee is asking, do we have any plans to develop more artist-friendly tools? I know that most of the tools in version 2X are more oriented towards the TD process. Uh, yeah, we are continually kind of moving up the ladder in that way. Like what we started with was essentially a graph that contains math and loops and if statements, right? Um, and then as time has gone on, we have more and more higher level geometry operations and more and more you know, large building blocks. Uh, the work that we're doing right now on component tags is, is one big step toward making the graph easier to use and making the, uh, uh, the, the, the more approachable for artists. Um, and we intend to continue going in this direction. Um, we intend to build out things like, um, we're looking very closely at manipulation uh, for things like brush-based workflows and things like that. Um, we're continuing to build out the simulation systems. The, the simulation systems, right out of the box, and based on the example graphs that we ship, will produce things like really beautiful explosions or snow and sand and things like that. Um, right out of the box without needing a lot of technical knowledge of their workings. Any updates that has you excited? Uh, I'm excited that we are finally getting the Bifrost Ocean simulations into the graph. Uh, seeing the boat wakes and things like that, um, that's been really cool to see. Jonah, it was great having you. Thank you for answering my questions, the community's questions. Any final words or anything you'd like to say? Um, yeah. Uh, thank you to the Discord community for, for all the work that you do. Um, thank you for answering each other's questions. Thank you for making it a vibrant place. Thank you for showing your work. Uh, it really energizes us every time that we see the beautiful work that you're producing. Um, and your questions help us understand what's confusing, right? If you answer a question, then you know what the person didn't understand. Um, so it's helping improve Bifrost all the time and creating a home for Bifrost users. So thank you very much.